Afghanistan at the moment is a country of contradictions. It's not officially at war, but you'd hardly say it's peaceful. The Taliban has lost power, but it holds key negotiating cards in peace talks with the United States. As those discussions continue, many Afghans, women in particular, are questioning what price they'll pay for long-term stability. I'm Melinda Nusifora, and I'm speaking to the First Lady of Afghanistan, Rula Ghani, one-on-one. -on -one. There is much more hope. I think Afghanistan is doing well. I think the women in Afghanistan are feeling very much part of the country. Their voices are being heard. The media has always been negative. To show that Afghanistan is about to crumble, it's very wrong. We have a constitution that is very strong. A peace is a long process. It's the other people that are at war with us. Mrs. Ghani, thank you so much for your time and speaking with us one on one. Let's begin with what's changed in Afghanistan. Undoubtedly, over the past 18 years, the country looks very different to what it did before. Talk me through what you think are some of the particular positive changes that you've noticed in society. Uh, I think there is much more hope among people. I think Afghanistan is becoming more of a normal country. And uh, when it comes to women, I think they're much more visible. Mm, talk this me through that a little bit more. They're, they're not just visible, but they are also heard. Indeed, indeed. This has been a long and, low pro uh, and slow process, but uh, uh, it started probably in 2001 with the departure of the Taliban. And uh, slowly, slowly, uh, the women started to have access to education, to have access to uh, medical uh, uh, services. Uh, they uh, were also uh, uh, able to join the workforce. Of course, in the beginning, it was the traditional things as teachers, as nurses, as midwives. But uh, uh, as they started going to university, they started uh, uh, branching out into different fields. And now we have uh, uh, women in all fields. We have them, uh, uh, quite a few of them in the legal field. We have about over 300 judges. We have uh, about, uh, I think, uh, 200 or so um, uh, prosecutors. Uh, we also have uh, public defenders. All these are women that uh, are engaged uh, in the justice system and have made the justice system much more, um, how shall I say, uh, uh, women friendly mm. because of their presence. Yeah. There is though a significant portion of the population that fear that Afghan women's hard fought gains could now be traded off or sacrificed during the peace negotiations in order for the Americans to have a quick withdrawal. Do you share those concerns and what can be done to safeguard the rights women have been able to claw back? I think you're right, there were these concerns, but I think uh, uh, ever since we've had the Lloyd Jirga, we need to put that all into a context. Uh, the, um, uh, my husband, the president, announced the launch of a peace process uh, about a year ago. And he even was managed to do a um, to um, call for, and uh, it happened. Uh, he managed to have a ceasefire for three days during uh, the Eid al-Fitr, and uh, uh, people were very uh, welcoming and were very happy, and they started beginning to hope again for peace. Um, since then, uh, there have been a lot of uh, different kinds of intervention. First of all, Afghan people themselves started discussing, and you're right, the women were very worried that uh, if ever uh, we uh, entered into negotiations with the Taliban, 
uh, one of the sacrifices we'll have to do would be the rights that they have acquired and the achievements that they have managed to get during the past 18 years. And do you think that's no longer a concern that they hold? Uh, for several reasons, I think it's no longer really a, a, uh, something that makes them not sleep at night. Of course, the concern exists, but they feel much more in control. Uh, one reason is that um, they were very active in voicing their concern and in speaking up and uh, uh, saying that this was almost like a red line that could not be crossed. Uh, the other aspect is that uh, the government itself, at its highest level, uh, is very pro-women, uh, in as much as we have uh, really encouraged women to join the government. We have maybe now 12 uh, deputy ministers. We have, uh, uh, in the past few years, we've had six women that were ministers. Right now, there are three uh, that are in, uh, in their post. Uh, we have encouraged women to work in the government at all levels, but also uh, the uh, private sector also. To, we have encouraged, we have now a chamber of commerce for uh, Afghan women, that they themselves, Afghan women entrepreneur, have created and uh, uh, have been granted the permission to have. And now they are really, uh, the last news I had is that um, they are competing in a um, in a kind of uh, award uh, ceremony in uh, Rio de Janeiro next June, where they have been selected out of 73 chambers of commerce, they selected 12, and the Afghan Chamber of Commerce was selected. So it means that they're really doing big strides. So the Afghan women are much more secure in where they are because they see that the political will is uh, with them and uh, uh, that they have been able to voice their concerns. Uh, what you have to add to that is that we've had recently the Lojirga, which is kind of a, um, uh, it's a very traditional uh, quasi-parliament. In my opinion, it's better than a parliament. A Lojirga is when you uh, gather people from all over Afghanistan and uh, to discuss one particular uh, issue. In this lawyer yes. there was, in the Western media, there yes. was some criticism written about it, about the way that women felt that they were treated during this process. Uh, we've had a very, uh, uh, Afghanistan has had a very uh, unfortunate uh, uh, relation with the media. In as much as uh, during the past uh, few years, the media has always been negative and has always picked up any little detail that was negative to show that Afghanistan is about to crumble, that it's a weak state and all this. It's how not the case. Is, how wrong is that then? It's very wrong. You, you came, you see, we live a very normal life. Yes, occasionally we have uh, 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 bouts of violence where uh, there is uh, uh, maybe there are suicide uh, bombers or there are uh, kidnappings and it's really uh, it's horrible to see the effect of these things but we move on and we carry on and we are living our life fully and our uh, our life has been improving very much especially in the past five years because the economy has been improving and so I think Afghanistan is doing well. I think the women in Afghanistan are feeling very much part of the country. Their voices are being heard. And uh, um, I'm not worried for them. And I don't think they are worried for themselves. You pointed out a lot of the successes of, of women and the roles uh, and positions that they've been able to make their own. Mm. To what extent has Afghan society in general accepted the greater role that women play? Is it true that there are still some segments in the society that have reservations about, about women in this new role? There are reservations as there are reservations in any country in the world. I've lived in Europe, I've lived in America, and there are places where women are not very much appreciated or valued. Uh, and to this, to this day, economists 
do not value the work of women at home, which I find totally an aberration because women are part of the uh, GDP of a country. Their work at home counts for something. So uh, I will not say that uh, women are here uh, much better than everywhere else, but I would say that there is a definite improvement in their situation. They have access to all the, uh, the things that they need to become important actors in society. And quite a few of them have, um, have had the courage to step in and to become public figures. So uh, yes, there might be still pockets here and there, and maybe in the provinces it is more than uh, in urban areas. But uh, we have conducted, uh, my office and some other organization, a survey of women in all 34 provinces. And uh, because we wanted to know what was their position towards peace. And we were surprised at the sophistication of their thought. Even those who cannot read or write, they can think. There appears to be a bit of a campaign almost of rebranding the Taliban. We are hearing stories about them playing cricket, assurances that they don't plan on turning back uh, to the, the past. Do you believe them? Uh, I'll believe it when I see it, okay? Uh, but uh, at the same time, they say that they don't like the constitution, our constitution, our Afghan constitution, which took 18 months to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to create. Uh, took, uh, uh, I don't know how many consultations all over the provinces with people. Uh, they say, oh, this is not an Afghan constitution. This is something that came from the West. Well, uh, their information is wrong. It is an Afghan constitution. And the way I see it, it is a unifying uh, element uh, for all members of Afghanistan because the constitution uh, states so many uh, important things like no Afghan is higher or lower than any other Afghan, that uh, men and, and women have the same access to, to the law, to services, that they are equal in everything. Uh, that uh, 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 that uh, uh, religion recognizes the two uh, uh, schools of thought, the Hanafi and the Jafari uh, uh, schools of thought. It is in the. Uh, also, one thing that was very interesting, um, one uh, um, woman who's an entrepreneur told me that uh, at first they were very worried about the Taliban because if ever they don't want the constitution, then the uh, free uh, economy uh, that we have, the system of free economy that we have here, would be totally in danger. It could not, and that a lot of people, not only women, but men and women that are business people, were worried about that. So we have a constitution that is very strong. And uh, the fact that the Taliban are telling us that the constitution needs to be totally changed. It makes me think that there is still a long way to go till we reach some kind of compromise and agreement. If you were sitting down at the negotiating table with the Taliban, what would you say to them? I don't visualize myself sitting down at the table for, I think there are some, um, how shall I say, there are, there are many more women that are more apt to be there for the negotiate to negotiate with the Taliban, well, I have a certain I knowledge. Rephrase it. Yes, let's what, rephrase. What, what message would you like to send to them? What would you like them to understand about you and about women in Afghanistan? Actually, I would like to tell them that Afghanistan is not the Afghanistan they came to in 1996. At that time, Afghanistan had uh, lost uh, a big, uh, uh, had lost a government. The army had totally disintegrated. Uh, and uh, um, after that, there were uh, a, uh, a uh, there was an episode of uh, a lot of chaos in Afghanistan. So when they came, when they entered Kabul, 
they came into a place that was no longer a real town. It was not really, it, not even a city. Uh, so uh, they have they have this dream that they'll come enter victorious in Kabul. Kabul now is six million people. At the time, it was not even half a million. Uh, Kabul at that time was totally destroyed. People, families uh, were uh, not uh, uh, in a good place. They came into a vacuum, and this vacuum does not exist anymore. And uh, in as much as there are Afghan, Afghan people, they are welcome to this country. Afghanistan is a, is a country for Afghans. But they will have to come and find out how we live, what are the rules we go by. And they will have to decide whether or not they like it. And if they don't like it, maybe they shouldn't come. In February, you presided over the most recent Afghan Women's National Consensus for Peace. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a gathering of about 3,500 women from right across the country. Yeah. Uh, they demanded a ceasefire from both sides and expressed concerns about the absence of women's voices in the peace process. Three months on, do you think that their voices have been heard and do you think any progress has been made? Well, we'll, get, we'll come back to the Loi Jirka, which was three months after. And indeed, uh, uh, women did have their place in the Loi Jirka. Uh, we, uh, even at the administrative, you know, there is a head of a chair of the Lojirga, which has secretaries of the five secretaries, there were, um, actually it has deputies, of the five deputies, two were women, and then had five secretaries, of which again, two were women, and the spokesperson for the Lojirga was a woman. Mm -hmm. So, um, somehow women have been woven into society, they're no longer on the margin. Um, the national consensus was an exercise as we decided to, uh, with some other organization, as I mentioned earlier, we decided to undertake because there was a lot of talk about women, uh, should they be at the table or not, uh, or we have to listen to the voices of women, but we were not seeing any effort to gather this information. And we decided that, okay, let's gather the women and let's have uh, listen what they have to say. And uh, we, um, we uh, started in Kabul and then uh, took it to every province. We had consultation with women in every province. Uh, we have made these results uh, public so people can access uh, them on our website. And uh, uh, we were... Uh, we tried not to be interfering. We just asked three questions, very simple question. What kind of peace do you want? What are the obstacles for peace? And what are the solutions in your idea? So we really tried not to inject our own ideas. And we said that, and there usually it, the consultation would take two to three hours, and we listened to what they had to say. And those of them who did not want to uh, speak up publicly, we distribute some paper and pencil. And um, for those who did not know how to read and write, we had uh, some young uh, school uh, girls who helped them write down their, uh, their, uh, their opinions and their concerns. Uh, so um, it was an exercise that required a lot of patience, a lot of, a lot of steadfastness, but that has given a lot of good results. At the Loijerga, we are, uh, we're not sure, but we think about 100 of the 900 women that were at the Loijerga. You know, 30% of the participants at the Loijerga were women. We, um, we found out that 100 of them had been, had taken, part in those uh, far to uh, far uh, far to reach uh, places and uh, uh, had been uh, selected or elected by their own uh, district or their own village to come and represent them at the Lojirga. So somehow uh, not only did we gather their opinions and uh, created a declaration that said uh, that gave the opinions of the women 
but we also seem to have encouraged them uh, to take the step to become public figures. Your approach as First Lady though is significantly different perhaps uh, to your predecessors. You are more visible, uh, you're more outspoken. How do you interpret your role as First Lady? Uh, I think the difference is even more than what you're mentioning. I'm much older than my pre predecessors. Uh, uh, the first lady before me was uh, uh, in her childbearing age and had four children during the... And if you've had children, you know that you don't have time to do anything else. <laughs> so I, I don't like to be compared. And uh, um, also the fact that I'm older, I, uh, um, there is a certain respect that comes with age in the society. And I have been able to, uh, to push the envelope, but not necessarily in a very scandalous way, no, but to be more present in public life. Uh, I don't necessarily go around in public. Uh, I do a lot of video messages. Uh, but I receive a lot of people in here. I have an open door policy and I like to listen to what people have to say. And uh, actually, this has helped me a lot because instead of coming and having ideas and saying, okay, this is what we're going to do, I listen to people, I see what their problems are. And when I see that there is a systemic problem, I try to address it. We had uh, like this, I helped uh, found a uh, cancer foundation. I helped uh, organize uh, with uh, the uh, relevant ministries uh, a, a treatment center for drug addicts. Mm -hmm. uh, I helped to encourage uh, uh, the office of the president to have a commission for women in prisons. Uh, I've uh, kept an eye on the orphanages you know, the usual things that First Ladies do. But uh, I think this is what I'm doing as, as myself, but maybe what I'm doing also is listening to people and encouraging them. Mm. I never tell them what they need to do because I don't know what their situation is. How can I tell them from just sitting here? But I tell them that you know, you find your solution and I will, I will be there to protect you. And it has really, um, it has helped them. And uh, I remember this uh, the story uh, like two years into my mandate and um, a lady who, has, uh, who runs a hotline was telling me that uh, had come to see me and I was saying, you know, I still, I'm not really well known. I don't really have much power. And she said, are you joking? I'll tell you, I had to, um, I had to dismiss one of my employees and you know what her reaction is? Oh, I'm going to go and complain to the first lady. <laughs> I said, wow. Your open door policy really does work then? It does work, it does work. Finally, how optimistic are you that there will be lasting peace in Afghanistan? And what place do you see women have in that society? Are you optimistic? By nature, I'm very optimistic. I think there is always a good in everyone and it's just, uh, you need to find it and to push for it. Uh, yes, uh, peace is a long process. We've been at war, I don't know. We have not, it's very interesting, the situation of Afghanistan and the Afghans. We have not been at war with other people. It's the other people that are at war with us. We are not, you know, trying to fight for something like more territory or uh, to kick somebody out. Or, no, it's the other people who are. And so in the case of Taliban, their uh, excuse is that uh, there are foreign troops and uh, we will fight until the foreign troops are, uh, are still here. But uh, we don't go after them. Actually, the government uh, in the areas where they live in Afghanistan, which supposedly, according to the press, they control, uh, the clinics are run by the government, the schools are run by the government, the, uh, the roads are, uh, uh, are fixed by the governments. Everything is done by the government. So, um, yes, let's get back to peace. You're saying peace. Peace is going to be a very long process because we need to talk and discuss it and we need to figure out what it is that is important for us and what it is that is uh, 
we can uh, compromise on. But so it's going to take a long time because we are very clear about what we want. And all we want is in our constitution. And if the other side is already saying this constitution has to go, it's, it doesn't sound like they want peace. So I'm not really quite sure because peace is between two parties. And uh, if uh, you'll ask any of one person, they all yearn for peace. But uh, I'm not really quite sure what, what the party facing us wants and what they will be willing to do. I guess being optimistic is all you can be then. <laughs> right. Mrs. Ghani, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.